Well, welcome. We're excited to uh, show you guys some really good stuff about high performance milling. My name is Scott Tian. I'm the Vice President of Innovation at Harvey Tool Company. Anybody using Harvey Tool out there? All right, thank you. Um, Helical Solutions is another brand. We'll, we'll show you that in a minute. Uh, again, I'm Vice President of Innovation, so I'm help, helping in the design of all the future tooling we're coming out with, including the tools for the HEM. I come from a jet engine background. I was a, basically a jet engine technician in the United States Navy, machinist, worked for Precision Twist Drill, Kenna Metal, all these kind of companies. So I got a little bit of experience, but I've, I've learned more from other people, you know, in this business. and. Uh, uh, definitely um, can machine a part, bro had broke tools, and I've lit machines on fire. So uh, I think I've, I've definitely uh, checked everything off I need to as far as that goes. And this is Don Grant. Yeah, my name is Don Grant, and I have a cutting tool problem. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought this was Cutting Tools Anonymous. I guess not. It so, kind of is. So I'm the national application engineer for Harvey Performance Company, which, like Scott said, includes Helical Solutions, Micro 100, and Harvey Tool. Um, so I'm the guy that actually leaves the house, goes to the spindle, and actually runs the tool. So a lot of experience at the spindle running Helical, Harvey, Micro 100. And as Scott said, you know, I, every time we always st uh, start these training, I do these trainings all over the country, and every time we start these and I talk to people that have experience with machining and milling, it's always that, well, what constitutes you with enough qualifications to tell us how to run end mills or help us run end mills. Well, I can tell you from 32 years of experience, I broke a lot of end mills. Like Scott said, I broke a lot of end mills. I broke a lot of drills, right? I mean, that's how we learn. We crashed a lot of spindles. And throughout those years, with all these techniques and things like adaptive clearing and, and uh, auto desk infusion, we get better and better and better. And through 32 years, and Scott's got over 30 years of experience, we, we've just gotten so good at helping new people, experienced people, uh, beginners of how to run cutting tools. So I've been doing it for 32 years, started at Precision Twist Drill, had my own company for 12 years. So remember I told you I broke a lot of end mills? I paid for all those end mills. <laughs> it was my company, which makes it even even worse, sure. but when you're paying for them and you break them, you, you learn how to use them pr pretty quickly. Okay, it doesn't always go good, and we know we got some Johns here. John, well, we, we even broke an end mill, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> no, I said we, I said we, I said we. And we got we that have, on video. We, we, I said we. But, but those are the things that kind of helps us explain to our customers, implement our tools, and, and uh, uh, give the right speeds and feeds and applications to run these. So I just wanted to show everybody here in the room our brand names. We won't dwell on it, but we're very proud of them. We've got some very rec recognizable brand names. Harvey Tool, a lot of users in this, uh, in this room. Helical, uh, I guess you could say Harvey's kind of our small diameter round tool, solid carbide uh, tools. We make a tool in Harvey that goes down to a thousandth of an inch, solid that, carbide. Plus or minus a thou. So if nothing yeah, that, shows up, you got what so you want. So if we're on the low <laughs> side of the tolerance, it's a very small tool. <laughs> Helical is going to be your solid carbide high performance round tool that goes from about a quarter inch. And we just made our first four inch diameter solid carbide tool, if you can imagine that. So big tool. And I think some of you may know of Micro 100. That's our you know uh, Swiss turning small boring bar company. We had just purchased them earlier this year. So this is a new acquisition for us. Uh, the other two have been together for quite a while. And what I'd like to point out, Harvey Tool, Boston, East Coast, yep. USA, Helical Solutions, Maine, all made in the USA, Micro 100s in Idaho. So all US branded companies, all made in the USA. I love pointing that out. Even when I go to customers, we implement these tools. Take a lot of pride in all these products are actually made right here in the USA. And we're hiring. And we're hiring. Anybody <laughs> want to move to Maine, Idaho? Yeah, potatoes. So that's a little bit about us. We're excited. You know, uh, high efficiency milling is something we are advocates, serious advocates of this kind of machining. I mean, we are on the road pretty much weekly training and doing and educating and trying. And, you know, it's exciting for me as a designer 
because we're designing all these high performance cutting tools and it's climbing now, but for the most part, the majority of have not been run at the parameters that we really want to run them at and that they're designed to be. And we'll tell you why, but it, we're getting to the point now where people are running these tools where we want them to be run at, where they're designed to be run at, and that's aggressive speeds and feeds. And some of the machine capabilities aren't even there yet, really, for the yep. end mills, for the tooling. You know, um, there's uh, speeds and feeds that can be accomplished with some end mills that, uh, you know, some of the Haas machines, some of the other machines won't really get there. So uh, we will. Yep. So the first thing we'd like to kind of go over just on some of our topics are what are some of the current milling challenges? You know, we'll explain about a few that we know about and that we experience as we're moving along. And I'll bet most people in this room have seen a lot of the same things that we're seeing. We'll cover those. What is high efficiency machining? The first thing I'd like to say on that just real quick is it has a lot of aliases high-speed machining, high-feed machining, high-efficiency machining. I think we've all in this room have heard it named a bunch of different various names. And, uh, you know, a lot of it all kind of goes to the same goal. It's like machining faster and harder and more efficient. We tend to call it efficient machining. is a little more applicable, we believe. And then we're going to talk about how to qualify an HEM application. There are times when it doesn't qualify necessarily. Okay. We'll talk and get into the nitty gritty on the MRR, the TEA. We'll explain what all these acronyms mean. Chip thinning, probably most have heard about chip thinning in this room. Does that make you cringe when you hear that word, chip, chip thinning? thinning? I've done a lot of these training. The minute I put up chip thinning, everybody goes, yeah, chip thinning. Because <laughs> they've heard, yeah, he's laughing because he knows, right? <laughs> because it, it's just been kind of beaten to death a little bit. The yeah. way, so we're going to try and explain it in a way you guys understand it and simplify it a little bit. And then finally, you know, one of our expertise is really selecting the tool, and we, we can help you with that. And, you know, we have an hour. I mean, a lot of this stuff could take three, four hours for us, so we're going to cram it quick. We will be available after this and any time after that to help you if there's anything we missed or you want to get into details on, on some certain applications. Be glad to, sh to show them. This is a slide that we show almost all of our customers. And you got to remember, a machinist is calling us saying, your tool's breaking. So we have to kind of always advocate and remind them, look, I don't necessarily put the slide up in front of them, but I say, look, it's all about the tool path. You know, so we want to see your tool path. Well, you're a tooling guy, but the tool path is very, very important to us. Because that, if that's wrong, the tool path tells the machine what to do, and the machine tells the tool what to do. The tool's just along for the ride. It has no say into what it's going into that corner, how fast. It has nothing to do with that. It just goes into that corner at 90 inches a minute because it was told to. So as we're out on the road, we're really trying to explain to customers, let's go back to the tool path and research and see what you're doing there first. And then let's look at the machine and let's look at some other things. So, you know, we got to kind of dissect the problem. Yep. Current milling challenges. Let's talk about some of the challenges, all right? This is a traditional tool path. We've all done this before. I think, uh, how many machinists in here? There's a lot of machinist programmers. Nice. So everybody in here cuts on awesome. machines, right? So traditionally, this is kind of what you get with a traditional tool path. It's an offsetting tool path. So what you have is you're always putting the end mill in situations it doesn't like. Like Scott said before, the tool path is driving the tool. Mm -hmm. In this traditional offsetting tool path that we'll talk about a little bit more in detail, you have tool breakage, you're losing the corners, you get chatter, you get chirping in these corners. So what we're trying to do is eliminate some of the traditional old school tool paths with HEM, high efficiency machining. The other thing we're seeing out there on the road is not only tool path issues, but we're underutilizing the tooling itself. We're, having long, we're seeing long lengths of cut being purchased used in very short depths of cut. Okay, which is creating a lot of havoc out there. We're snapping tools, deflection, chatter, um, catastrophic failure, losing a part, losing a finish. Um, when really, you know, we can, as we move along through here, you'll understand, but you know, if we're not doing HEM, we should be going to a shorter tool and strengthening it up. 
But we see this a lot where we're taking a very small axial and we're using a really long tool, which is not what we want to do. So this is something we're seeing out there. The tooling is just being under underutilized. So you, you'll hear me say this throughout this presentation for the next 50 minutes, but I don't think we're beyond an hour, but two things are going to kill an end mill. Two main things that we're looking at are going to kill an end mill. Anybody know what those two things are? Heat, number one, right? Heat's going to kill an end mill real quick. That's why the coatings, the substrates, everybody's trying to get the right coatings, the right substrates. The second one is vibration. Vibration. Heat and vibration are the two things we're trying to eliminate. So if you look at these pictures here in the old school traditional toolpath, you're bringing in a lot of heat from a heavy radial step over, and you're bringing in vibration too as well. And we'll talk about that in more detail. But you're doing that because of that light radio step over and that helix. End mill's got a helix, right? A lot of people think the helix is to evacuate chips on an end mill. It's to evacuate chips on a drill, mainly on a drill. An end mill, it's a little bit different. The, the helix angle serves a lot of purposes on an end mill. So when you're taking a light axial depth of cut, you're having problems with the vibration with that. So you'll hear me say heat and vibration in a couple slides as we get going. Tool holders are very, very critical to the mission in high efficiency machining. You know, there's a lot of brands, there's a lot of styles and all that. Our main goal and, and what we advocate is accuracy, 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 and low run out in the machine, the tool, in the holder, in the machine. You know, we'll get a phone call and the guy will say, you know, I've got like three tenths run out. And we'll, we'll ask our next question is, where'd you check it? In the presetter. We don't want to check it in the presetter. I mean, you can do that, but I really want to see what it is in the holder, in the machine, with a mag base and a dial indicator. And I want to check it on all the corners. I want to spin that tool. And we want to see about three tenths, five tenths max. Okay? Kind of depends on the diameter of the tool. Obviously, the smaller the tool, we want that sh uh, shrunk. But on a half inch tool, three eighths, we want three to five tenths max. Especially in an HEM environment, especially yep. when we're going to high efficiency machining, using adaptive tool paths. We really want to make sure everything's shored up from the spindle, the machine tool, down to that tool so you can eliminate runout, you can eliminate the tool, you can eliminate those issues. This is kind of, kind of an eye opener right here. I mean, for every one tenth, you lose about 10% of your tool life. So think about that. I mean, five tenths, I mean, you could be at half the tool life pretty quickly. So I mean, it's kind of a, it's a rule of thumb, um, but very, very important, okay? And we like to see a maximum of five crashes per month. That's yeah. it. Anything over no that? No more than five crashes on that spindle. <laughs> Anything over that, it's no good, that's it. <laughs> Nobody's ever crashed a spindle in here, right? I saw the hands machinist. Who crashed, anybody ever crashed a spindle? Well, nobody's gonna, today, see, that's the right answer, today? If you're not uh, hitting a spindle, you're not getting close enough to the... Like to I the said, this can be a very in-depth conversation. There's shrink, there's milling chucks, there's all kinds of tool holders out there. And there's you know brand names and, and all that. Um, we'll be glad to discuss that with any of you guys in more in detail on what we like to use. We have had a lot of success with an SK20 holder from Lindex. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. But we have had some really good success with that, with that holder. And, you know, I mean, shrink, too, we've had a lot of success. But you're not going to go into a, a small shop with four Haas machines and buy a whole shrink fit system. It's just not going to happen. It's very expensive. So, so, but we can, you know, like I said, we, we'll be more than happy to go more in depth on tool holders if that's a question on down the line. There's a nice fixture. <laughs> John, have you ever <laughs> put a fixture together like that? I haven't seen a video on that one yet, have we? <laughs> <laughs> so improper part fixture, right? You're, you're working on the spindle, your tool holder, you got the right end mill in there, you got the right machine tool. You want to make sure your part is fixtured to the table really good, especially when you're running super alloys, exotic materials, stuff like that. Materials that are going to push back more than mm -hmm. your 1018s, your, your, your low carbon stuff, you know, even some of your 300 series stainless, some of the 303s. The material is going to push. You really need to make sure your fixture is supporting your part before you start introducing the end mill. Now, that being said, that being said, and I love bringing this up, running a high efficiency tool path is going to help this situation a lot better than running a traditional tool path on this. Putting that pressure on, it's going to take a lot less pressure off of your part by running a high efficiency tool path. 
because you're changing a lot of variables to put the end mill in a great condition to actually run so there's not a lot of heat, there's not a lot of vibration, and there's not a lot of pressure. I think I would just like to add to that real quick. What, where we can get in trouble with HEM, you're right, it does take a lot of pressure off the part. But if a part has a feature that I call a diving board or an area that is thin and not well supported, even though we're taking some pressure off, we are elevating the speeds four to five times where we normally would be. So you might have you know, some good fixturing in areas, but we might have a feature that's really causing problems at these elevated HEM speed and feed rates that we're getting ready to employ or what have you. So it's not just the, you know, it's, it's uh, features too can be a problem. Which brings us to the machine tool, right? Machine tool has a lot to do with it. You're gonna run an adaptive tool path. You're gonna run high efficiency machining. The machine's gotta keep up. The look ahead's gotta be there. The processor's gotta be there. It's gotta be able to handle some of these tool paths. Yeah. Now, Scott brought up a good point before that high efficiency kind of took the place of certain other names. We like to call it high efficiency machining, whereas before it was high speed machining. Now, you can run a high efficiency tool path on a proto track mill. You can, in a straight line movement, because the practice that we're going to teach you about high efficiency machining, when you understand it, it's really the axial radial depth of cut to make sure the tool is engaged properly. So you can do that in a G1 straight line, right? You can do that, and as long as you're not hitting certain scenarios, high efficiency machining means you don't need 15, 24,000 RPM. You don't need that to run high efficiency machining because it's a strategy. You just gotta make sure your inch per tooth, your axial depth and your radial depth match your RPM that you're actually running. So you can still get elevated tool life in a prototrack and other machines if you employ the right strategy in HEM using that. So you don't need that RPM. You don't need that 12, 15, 24K RPM. Does it help? Or the, or the well, horse Mainly power. in aluminum, sure it does, but I don't know anybody running in canal at 15,000 RPM. If they are, give us a call. Look us up, <laughs> I know what's going on. Or maybe they're doing it for a minute. So what is high efficiency milling? I mean, Already get it? some of you may know, but we threw some bullets up here that we talk about, the three main bullets when it comes to HEM. The tool path, we kind of talked about that a little bit ago. Um, you know, maximum productivity manages the cutting forces. I mean, it really keeps us out of trouble. That's the best way to put it. You know, it will either maintain, you know, it maintains the metal removal rate through radial or axial or feed rate. Um, all software is a little bit different. I believe adaptive actually adjusts the radial depth of cut so that we don't go over our maximum metal removal rate, keeping that tool out of trouble. Tooling. So look, there's a lot of tools out there and there's a lot of dang good tools out there too, not just us. Um, but going to a general purpose tool you know, and a four flute tool is definitely gonna shorten the process and, and really just leave you up short in an HEM application. A lot of us um, that make the high performance tools, we use very high grade substrates. We do multiple flutes, which we'll talk about as we move through here. So, uh, you know, you don't wanna employ a four flute general purpose end mill in an HEM tool path. You're not gonna get the tool life and the productivity that you need out of it. And then the depths of cut, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's all about radial and axial depth of cut, our flute count on our tooling, and our tool path. That's really what HEM is all about. Those three things need to be figured out. Okay, so let's dive into a little bit what HEM is and how it actually affects the tools, and we'll, we'll kind of dissect this a little bit. So a traditional tool path is basically taking a heavy radial depth of cut and a light axial depth of cut. You're, you're putting that tool in a situation where number one is you're generating a lot of heat like we talked of because we're in the cut for a long time. When you're in the cut for a long time, you generate heat, you generate a lot of heat. And the fact that we're taking a light radial depth of cut, all we're doing is wearing the bottom of the end mill off. So I always tell everybody on these two slides, if you take a look at this, you know, you don't buy an inch and a quarter length of cut on a tool and only use 100 thou on it. It's like going to Subway and buying a 12-inch sub and only eating seven inches, throwing the rest in the garbage. Buy a seven-inch sub, 
Now, you guys are going to say they don't make a 7-inch sub, but have you asked? No, I'm just kidding. I, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't asked. Maybe they'll make a 7-inch sub. But it's like that. You, you don't want to underutilize the tools that you're using. Yeah. So if you're, going to, if you're going to buy an inch and a quarter length of cut on your end mill, try and use all that inch and a quarter inch length of cut. If you only need a half inch on the bottom of that end mill, then buy a tool with a half inch length of cut, especially if you're in a production environment. Maximize the length of cut. So what we're doing here from a traditional standpoint and taking a light uh, axial depth of cut and a heavy radial depth of cut, now what we're doing is we're going to take a light radial depth of cut, radial, the side, peripheral. We're going to go with a light radial depth of cut, and we're going to go with a heavy axial depth of cut. So we're going to use the whole flute length. Whatever that flute length is, we're going to try and use the whole flute length. I said try because flute lengths vary, right? And, and you, got, you got a sweet spot, and then you have below a sweet spot, and you have above a sweet spot. That's how it works. I don't have any slides up here, but I'd love to talk to you guys more about that. If you guys want to meet me out there, we can talk about cutting tools and what to use. But there is a sweet spot in HEM. There's a sweet spot. There's a sweet spot for speeds and feeds in HEM too as well, okay? So as you get over a certain amount and under a certain amount, it starts changing a little bit. What this scenario does right here is stabilizes the cutter. Why, do, why does it stabilize the cutter? Let me, let me explain. When you take a light axial depth of cut, a light axial depth of cut with four or five flutes, because you can only use four or five flutes with a light axial depth of cut and a heavy radial, right? Because you'll plug up the chips. When you do that, you have one flute that enters the material. It exits before another flute comes in because of that helix angle in there. That's when you need to start changing the helix angle to get more flutes in there. So what we're doing in this scenario over here is we're taking a bigger axial, a lighter radial, and we're engaging more flutes in the material at one time. So the tool is always under load when it gets under the material, right? But when one flute enters and exits and they're not at the same time, it's under load, it's not under load, it's under load, it's not under load, so you start getting this with the bottom of your end mill. That's where the vibration comes from. You have a heavy radial depth of cut. That's where the heat comes from. So what we're doing is we're taking a light radial depth of cut. We're getting rid of the heat. We're, we're, we're putting more flutes in the cut. We're stabilizing the cutter. We're bringing an adaptive tool path in there. Adaptive tool path is helping us run that tool so it knows where it's going. We have predictability. So what we're doing here is taking out the heat and the vibration in this slide right here. Does it make sense? Kind of I think sense? the other thing too that I would like to note on that longer tool is we've employed what's called variable pitch tooling or variable helix tooling. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. And um, you know, vari variable pitch is just simply the spacing between the flutes. So anything, anytime anything's symmetrical, you tend to build a harmonic signature when you're running it or cutting with it or what have you. The harmonic signature builds and it keeps building until it turns into chatter, okay? So our whole goal on that is we are gonna build a harmonic signature, but we wanna knock it down. So what happens is when we take the flute spacing, it's like a pie, right? So if you had a four flute tool, right, they'd be 90 degrees apart. Um, if you just tweak those a little bit, so one spacing might be 88 degrees, another one might be 101 degrees on the spacing. What happens is we start running that tool, the harmonic signature builds, until the next flute comes around at a different spacing and then it knocks the signature down again and it tries to build again on vibration. Then the next tooth comes around at a different timing and it knocks it down again. And that's how a variable pitch tool controls the vibration. It doesn't get rid of it, but it controls it. And a variable helix does the same thing, okay? And if you guys are employing HEM techniques and you buy an end mill with an inch and a quarter flute length, how much of that flute you think you can use? Inch and a quarter. Inch, you say uh, inch and a quarter. Inch, inch and an eighth is more than acceptable. An inch is an accept, acceptable. Once you start getting below an inch, it's probably you're, you're, you should get an inch length of cut. But there's always a plus tolerance on a length of cut on an end mill. It's always a plus tolerance. So you always have that. You can use all of the flute length in an HEM. So you can use all the inch and a quarter. If your part demands it, right? Part might not demand it. You might only need to take three quarters of an inch, in which case get an end mill with a three quarter inch length of cut. 
Now, if you have, and I always say this, if you have, because I have my own shop, if you have an end mill with an inch length of cut, and you only need three quarters, and you got one tool or one part you have to make, use the, that's fine, use the inch length of cut. Nobody's going to, you know, blame you. But if it's a production environment and you're doing parts over and over and over, the right way to do it for your shop, for, for the owner's shop, for anybody's shop, corporation's shop, is to get the right tool to maximize your, your throughput and your, your productivity and tool life. So this is kind of the strategy. I actually did a just a two-pocket situation here. Everybody's familiar with adaptive clearing, right? Adaptive clearing, what, and I like using this with the other strategy as an analogy. So basically what adaptive clearing is doing, and this is a good analogy, I think, because I used it two times, and I don't get any clapping, but I get some nodding, so I know it's good. <laughs> but, <laughs> so so think, think about this as, as driving a car down a windy road, right? So you're driving the car, every time you get to a corner, you gotta, you gotta step on the brake, you gotta slow down, you gotta turn. The car is doing all these different things, right? And, and it's, it's, it's kind of disruptive. What the tool path, what adaptive clearing tool, uh, tool path does for the end mill is it takes that windy road and makes it straight. It makes it straight. So that end mill is pretty much, you know, running autonomous, right, pretty much by itself, it knows the path, it doesn't see any curves, and therefore you can get a lot more predictability out of your end mill. If it thinks it's only going straight and doesn't have to run in any corners, you're going to get a lot more predictability. So this is kind of the tool path that drives the end mill. That's for the end mills, just like Scott said in the beginning, it's along for the ride, right? So if it's along for the ride, don't make it open its eyes and see where the curves are. Let it just go straight. So it's changing conditions in the tool path to make the end mill think it's going down a straight road versus a curvy road. That's what adaptive uh, tool path is doing for that end mill. Scott, anything to add on that? No, no, you hit it. No, and you guys know the men's, everybody use adaptive, the men's and maxes on your radiuses and your corners. I think and one one key parameter on there would be the lift the lift off you know from the bottom. Uh -huh. When you're doing HEM, we don't want to drag the bottom of the tool on the floor at all. So uh, you know there, we definitely want some lift off. I, I think we usually use ten thou, just to make sure that that tool's coming up off that part. And when we're wrapping to reposition, we definitely don't want to drag the tool. It'll definitely burn the tool up. So because we like doing repositioning moves very fast. We'll do the highest cutting feed rate we possibly can to do repositioning moves if possible. Get rid of time. <clears throat> Qualifying an HEM application. These are some good questions that we often ask, and uh, you know, not every situation is is HEMable, if that's a word. Is your tool holding optimal? We won't go into that a whole lot, but we talk. Do they have good tool holding? I mean, if the guy brings you a tool holder that's a side lock welding holder that's been in the spindle for about 35 years, I probably would suggest maybe looking at a different holder. But they're out there. They want to use holders forever. You know, if, if he's insistent on it, then check the run out. If we got 1,000 or 1,000 and a half, we shouldn't be using it for HEM. Are your part holding conditions ideal? Now, Don did kind of uh, talk about, and it's true, that you know, HEM takes a lot of pressure off the part. Um, but we still need good, secure work holding. We do a lot of mighty bite holding. We do a lot of dovetail holding. I'm not saying you need two inches on a block to hold it all the time. There's good work holding that doesn't require a lot of space, but it needs to be secure. Spindle condition, five crashes a, a day? No, it was a month. A month is not light, acceptable. Light crashes. You know, so it's funny. Bands, it doesn't break. I'm telling you, we've been in this business a long time selling tools, and the first thing blamed as a tool breaking is the tool. And so when we start getting down to the nitty gritty with you know, a customer, and we say, well, what's your drawbar tension? Let me see the pull stud in the tool holder. You know, what's it look like? What's your taper on your tool holder look like? When's the last time your taper's been trued up on your machine? You know, and next thing you know, I don't know where the guy is. He's, like scattered, you know. I mean, those are very, very important things that drive the success of our tool. Um, this is a big one, and, and I, you know, uh, to me, it's very important. HEM 
can really scare a lot of people in a shop that are only used to traditional machining. I mean, if they're running stainless steel, you know, at 40 inches a minute, taking a heavy radial and a light axial, and we're gonna come in and wanna run 175 inches a minute and quadruple their metal removal rate, it does, it could freak them out. I mean, it's happened before. We've had an Inconel customer that backed out and said, I just, my, my guys can't handle this right now. It's a bit scary, you know, so. But we reduced the cycle time like almost by two thirds. So, uh, you know, it's good, but it is a culture thing. So we gotta make sure the shop is willing to embrace it. Well, I don't know how anybody couldn't embrace that, but typically if you're running a three quarter or one inch, well, you would, hopefully you're not running a one inch tool and a 40 taper, but we see a lot of three quarter and five eighths. Um, we really wanna get three quarters down to half inch, maybe five eighths and a 40 taper. And we like selling you a smaller tool. We really do. It sounds odd, but it's good for us because number one, we have more configurations in tool geometry in half inch than any other size. It's the most popular diameter out there. Well, you're gonna find a machine loves it, your tool load goes way down, and your costs are like almost in half. And we can actually get, in some cases, more productivity out of a half inch than a three quarter. So bigger is not always better in this case when we're talking HEM. Cam package, if, you, if we have adaptive, we're good to go. Fusion. <clears throat> this is a kind of a key one, and Don, you might talk about this a little bit. Yeah, do you know your material exactly? One thing, I, I told this story before, but I teach at a college. I'm, I'm on an advisory board at a college, and we're working with students. And, and one of the biggest things, you know, all the companies have issues with is a lot of the students, a lot of people don't know their material well enough. They know that it's stainless. They might know it's 300 series. They might know it's 400 series. They might know it's uh, H13, but maybe they don't know what the hardness is. They don't know what the rock well is. They don't know what the condition is. Very important to understand what that material is you're cutting in your shop, what the condition of that material is. Does it have scale on it? Is it, is it decarb free? It, you know, what is the, is it H900, is it H1100, H, uh, you know, whatever. What condition is that material in? That's gonna help us as end mill uh, experts to, to dial in the speeds and feeds. It's gonna help anybody, whether it be us or anybody else, dial in those speeds and feeds, especially if there's an end mill issue. The, the, we get a lot of questions where people call me up on the phone and they'll say, I'm cutting 400 series stainless. What are you cutting? 420. We try and get as much, what, is it hard? Not nah, soft. You go and run it, break an end mills, go to the shop, check the rock well, 52 rock well. It's, it's hard. I don't know. You know, it's, it's important. And material is important. That's the first part. You put the material in there, you're purchasing the material, your customer demanded some material. You know, so just make sure you know what the condition is before you start running speeds and feeds. And you know, a new supplier on material can, your material can react differently. So we'll have somebody using a tool and man, they're doing HEM and everything's going great and all of a sudden things start going awry uh, and they change material suppliers. So we've seen that before where it can be a problem. So very, very key for yep. us. Are you roughing enough material? So there are instances where HEM and maybe adaptive may not make sense, you know? If a part is near net, there's, this could add more time than delete for you, okay? So typically what we see in, in, with HEM and, and all these kind of strategies is when we're remov removing a lot of material, that's where these kind of tool paths come into play big time, okay? More near net, you may not get the bang for your buck. Obviously you can try it, you can sim it out, um, but it just may not, you know, give you the, the the bang for your buck that you need, so. Yeah, is a trachoidal slotting scenario faster than a full slot? John, you probably know this. It's, it, I'm not saying is it better. I'm, you know, I'm just saying is it faster? In all situations, might not be, right? You can run two times D in some end mills, you know, like that, one times D. If you're doing a trachoidal slot, it's gonna save on your end mill, but is it necessary faster? So I think what Scott's saying is, are you roughing enough material? Do you have more production run? Is it the right strategy to use a trachoidal slot in that situation that it would be to go one, two times D with the right end mill? That's a decision you guys have to make, but, but those are the questions you have to ask yourself. 
And, it, and it, uh, it might be a decision that the material makes for you. Yes. Right? Hard, so yeah. if you're slotting Inconel 718, absolutely brutal, right? Tricoidal might be the way to go just so a tool will survive through that. Um, but we're running 4140, may not make sense. Yeah, or 1018 or something yeah, like that. We might that. be able to might... slot full slot with a four flute tool, maybe with chip breakers or teeth on it, and do just fine. So the, sometimes the material makes the decision too for us. So now we'll kind of dive into this a little bit. We, we showed this slide at the beginning, so fully understanding the tool path and material. We talked a little bit about educating yourself on the material you're cutting. Very important, making sure you know what material is in there before you create the tool path. Your radial depth of cut and your axial depth of cut, we're talking about that axial depth of cut, right? We said a light radial depth of cut and a heavy axial depth of cut. Well, it all depends on what the feature is on your part. Right? Because you can sit there and go, hey, you got to be HEM in that. You got to HEM that part. And then you look at it and somebody's only going down, you know, maybe 150 thou or the part's getting ready to be, it's going to be surfaced and you have more of a step up roughing pass or something like that. You have to have enough there to use an HEM strategy. You want to utilize as much of that flute length as possible. Tool speeds and feeds, very critical in making sure this tool path is utilized correctly. Fully understand the machine tool, spindle condition, run out. We talked about that, tool holding, work holding. Fully understand tooling options. This is big. This is where we're going to come in, right? I always tell everybody I walk into every shop, right? I, I don't want to say I know enough about, you know, machines to be dangerous. I, I've run machines for a long time. But I'm not the expert at your shop, at your material, at that machine. I don't know what that condition of that spindle is in. I wasn't there. I don't know the glitch in the programming, right? I don't know what the concentration is, even though I asked the question on the coolant. I don't know all those scenarios. So I walk into every situation going, I'll tell you what, you're the expert on all that stuff, but I'm going to claim fame to this one. All right? I'll be the expert on the end mill. We'll try and put the right end mill into your situation. And even if the machine does have run out, mm -hmm. it might have run out. Maybe we need a stronger core, right? Maybe we need more flutes. Maybe we need to back off the radial depth of cut because your machine has run out. Right? Those are things you can do. So I know we talked about the ideal situation of making sure you got a rigid spindle. Don't crash the spindle. You got to have the right tool holder, right? Well, if you don't have those situations, you don't need to get up and walk out of the room and go, oh, that's HEM's not for me. It's just putting the right tool in the right situation to take you from here to here, mm -hmm. right? You just want to make improvement. Now, that improvement might not be where maybe Boeing is or Pratt & Whitney or something like that. It might not be there, but if it's from here to there in your shop, score, right? Win. That's it. I mean, it is. And, and we, we talk about, and, and I've had and John, and I've worked with John, and shout out to John. He's helped us a lot with testing, actually on end mills to give a really good end mill. But you know, we've had these conversations and you know, we're tool guys. We're, we're, also, we want to run our tools at five, 600 inches a minute, right? We want to run them fast. But it's not always the situation for your application. Trust me, a good tool guy will know that it's not right for you. And if you call us, you call Scott, you call any of our application engineers, and if they don't, you call me, I'll give you my card, and I'll go whop them on the head or something like that. But they should be fitting the speeds and feeds into your machine. I know I can run 550 inches a minute in 4140. I've done it. I ain't going to do it in a Haas. I ain't going to do that. I'll probably start out at 250, you know, depending on what the tool path is. So it's really fitting the end mill. This is where we come in to your situation. Make sure we guide you in the right direction with what you guys are using at your machine tool, what your experiences are to take you from here to here. Very important, I think, for us. And very important for any manufacturing rep to try and give you guys what's in your best interest, not what's in our best interest. And I know people say that and they'll sell it over and over. Work with me a couple times and I guarantee you, I'll make sure you get the right tool. We'll make sure you get the right tool. Now we had a pause in it, a sleeper. <laughs> so metal removal rate, this is kind of the key on HEM. This is how we understand if our tool is maximizing the amount of cubic inches per minute we can with this tool. This is a very good measurement. I don't know if a lot of you already use it. It's very simple to calculate. It's your axial times your radial times your inches per minute. It's that simple, right? It's called the metal removal rate. And um, a lot of times, I mean, we use, we, we, in our heads, we know what kind of metal removal rates we should get out of what kind of materials. 
We know what we've done. Okay, so uh, you know, I think the other day uh, we were just getting about eight cubic inches a minute out of titanium, which is a lot of cubic inches out of a titanium. Lot of cubic inches. It's a different strategy on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of cubes. So um, this is a very, very important calculation, and it'll come in handy here as we move through this. Yeah, this, this is really, I, I use this a lot. What I, I use this for as an application engineer is basically finding out where we're starting, right? Yep. Where, where is my cubes right now? What am I doing? I mean, that's a good benchmark. You know, a lot of people are doing cost savings, big drawn out cost savings documentation. This is a good benchmark. Come in, calculate where you're running today, implement new, new strategies, use the same formula, axial times radial times inch per minute, and see where you're calculating tomorrow with your new tool path. Absolutely. And then you got everything else tool life that you can judge on that too. And at least you'll know where you're at. It's a, it's a good first starting point. So, so let's take a look at that. If you're looking at this graph here, and we're talking MRR, cubic inches of material removed per minute. That's what MRR is, cubic inches of material removed per minute by axial times radial times inch per minute. So if we only take a 4% radial step over, say a half inch ML, we're stepping over 4%. But we're actually going two times D with that end mill. By the way, I said sweet spot. Anybody know what it is? Two times D. That's sweet spot on an HEM. My opinion, I've run a lot of tools. Right around two times D is sweet spot. Two and a half to one and a half, that's the window I found. Once you get outside of that window, things change. You got to start changing some of your parameters. But when you go two times D, I didn't go on a tangent there, did I? No, now I'm going on a tangent. <laughs> See, I just said I was going on a tangent. No, it's sorry. It's got to reel so you back. Two Two times D at a 4% step over, which is a light step over, we're at 4.83 cubes. We just take that to 10% 10 10 step over, but only go one and a half times. We went from 4.83 cubes to 3.35 cubes. Because we take had to it, pull the feedback. You're right, got to take the feedback, and we're actually taking this big multiplier here, which is your axial depth of cut, taking that off really drops your multiplier. You're removing a lot less material. Let's take it all the way over to 40%. Here's traditional, right? Quarter times D, 40%, 0.488 cubes, less than a half cube is where you're at traditionally. And you're beating up your end mill, you're wearing out your corners, and you didn't eat the whole sub sandwich, right? You only ate, you only ate a little and threw the rest in the garbage. So you can see by this chart, it's a good example of how MRR is measured from a light radial depth of cut versus an old traditional axial depth of cut. Not to mention your tool life is astronomical from the other. So choose the highest MRR. So what happens here is, you know, we've had this where we turn HEM, you know, onto people that haven't done it before, and, and your program's gonna get longer. I mean, your radial depth of cut is smaller, a lot smaller. So there's more lines of code, right? So. There's more step overs in the program. The program's gonna be longer. And it's a mind thing with a lot of people that haven't done that before, thinking I'm gonna take more passes, I'm gonna lose time. We can actually prove through the calculation, we're actually gonna do more passes in a shorter amount of time. And you're gonna have a beautiful tool at the end that hasn't broke, hasn't chipped. You might even be able to get resharpened, you know, because it's still in fairly good, it's just dull which is what we like. Ooh, yeah. chipped in. in. <laughs> Should we skip this one? No, <laughs> That's go with chipped in. no, this is a good one. So chip thinning. Chip thinning, the definition of chip thinning is when the radial depth of cut is less than 50% of the diameter. So a half inch of tool, 50% of that diameter is 250 thousandths. When the radial depth of cut is less than half of the diameter, it causes the chip to be formed to be less than the actual inch per tooth. I think that's actually the actual definition. Yeah, I, very good. I've done this too many times. Yes. But it's actually <laughs> less. When you get beyond 50% at that feed, if you're running 50 inches a minute and you're less than 50% of that diameter, that chip being formed is less than what you programmed. That's as simple as that. It's less than what you programmed. You program a two thou inch per tooth, and you're at 30% step over. This is 12, we can use 12 as good. And you're at 12% step over. That chip that was two thou is now a thou. I'm doing the math in my head, Brown. You probably got that math all figured out. Is it right about thou two tenths, maybe? 12%, eh, maybe it's around thou two tenths. But it's less than what's programmed. 
So you got Anmil guys up here. You got people that are putting all this information in a catalog, and we said that Anmil runs best at 2,000 chip load. That's where you need to run it. Well, you take a light radio depth of cut, and guess what? You're not running a 2,000 chip load. You're running less than a 2,000 chip load. And with a lot of high performance end mills, there's an edge prep on the edge of the end mills. We put an edge prep. Helical Solutions puts an edge prep on there. There's a edge prep to make the edge of that tool stronger. So if you start thinning that chip out and you get the chip too small because you thinned it, what are you doing? You're rubbing because your cutting edge went from positive to negative. Stronger, but you're going to rub it to death depending on the material you're actually running. So it's very important that you recalculate. Anybody know how to combat this? How do you combat thinning the chip? Yeah, we all know that. We? So we're all machinists to feed it faster. You feed it faster, right, to make up for that thinner chip. So you're going to actually take a program chip, you're going to make it bigger, and then it's actually going to thin itself down to what's recommended. That's chip thinning in a nutshell, right? If right here is 2,000, and here's your material. Right here's not 2,000, is it? That's like 1,000 and 2 tenths. And then as I get down further and further, my chip is getting thinner and thinner and thinner. Think about what happens when you're running a, well, we have Harvey Tool, a 10,000 end mill, right? <laughs> Chip's pretty thin. Not a lot of edge prep on a 10,000 end mill, by the way, if you're wondering. <laughs> but uh, but when, it, when the, the diameter of the end mill gets smaller, you even have more issues with chip thinning. So it's very important to make sure you calculate the right chip thinning parameters. Now, do you need to do that in your head? There's a lot of software that does that. We have software, John's got software, there's software everywhere that'll calculate the chip thinning parameters on that. You don't have to do it in your head. That's chip thinning in a nutshell. We're gonna change it to chip management. Sound better? Chip management is way better than chip thinning. But everybody gets it, right? So you can see here, chip thinning feed adjustment. We're feeding this up. The feed per tooth is less than 50%. So we need to feed it up. We need to run it faster. We need to run it faster because we have a thinner chip. We got about uh, 10 minutes left. Yep. I want to let you know. We, we have a thinner chip. One thing I want to bring up to this, and we don't have it in the slide, but I want to really drive this home a little bit with efficiency, right? It's, 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 it's uh, a high efficiency milling, right? So if heat is the problem, right? Heat's the problem. We don't want to heat up the end mill. And what does heat do with surface foot? Surface foot is calculated to put enough heat into the chip from the cutting edge to plasticize the chip to make it annealed enough to break the chip away from the cutting edge. So if we take the heat out of the chip, OK, and heat at the chip point is calculated by surface foot, what do you think we can do when we remove the heat and use these strategies with surface foot? You can bring it up, right? You can bring it up because the heat that was there before that you were generated in a traditional tool path is now backed off. Surface foot comes up. Surface foot is controlled with RPM, right? RPM is what you calculate inch per tooth on, right? Inch per tooth is how fast you're going. So you can see where this is going. To the limitation of the machine and everything that you have, there's a limitation there. That's what I'm saying, there's a limitation there. But if you're running some hard super alloy materials, titanium, where you're already running low, right? You're running 10 inches a minute, eight inches a minute. Now you're at 40, 60, 80 inches a minute, which is well within the machine's range on some of that material, okay? When you run a 1018, now you're, you, you, you don't really want to apply it. And even with HEM strategies, you can use a four flute and HEM and five flute. We don't have that in the slide, but I bring that up in some of the presentations. But I want people to know that when we take the heat out, that's where you're seeing elevated surface levels. So whereas you're running 4140 traditionally at 400 surface foot, now you're at 850, 900, 1,000, 1,100, depending on what your radial step over is, using these strategies using these strategies, because you're taking the heat out. Take the heat out, put more heat in there. Well, thank you, Mr. Chip Thinning. I'm sorry. Appreciate it. That's Chip Thinning in a nutshell. Very good, very good. So this applies to the Chip Thinning calculation that we pretty much just looked at. If you look at AE here, this is an angle that's produced from our 
basically our chip thinning calculation and our, our angle of attack, if you will, with these end mills. So the first one here on the left shows you a 50% step over. You can see the slice of pie is about 90 degree. You go to the middle one, that's a lighter step over, the light green, and it kind of de determines your, that's the material cutting. And we get to the far right, that's our HEM strategy. So you can see that what we call the tool engagement angle gets smaller as our step over gets shorter, uh, thinner, okay? Which is good, which is what Don was talking about. We started thinning the chip and all that and reducing the heat. So increased is gonna be most of the typical things you've heard of, shorter tool life, overloading, uh, no chip thinning obviously because we're at 50%, fewer lines of code that I talked about a little bit ago. And pretty much the exact opposite is what's in our favor with lower tool engagement angles, which is employing chip thinning. Next one. It's a little bit different when we do an inside curve and we, when we do an outside curve, okay? On an inside curve, our tool engagement actually increases because we have more surface contact, especially in a tighter corner, okay? So um, it's a lot of the reason why you hear a lot of squawking in a corner, because the tool engagement angle has actually increased on people. But when you do an outside corner over there, it actually decreases. That's why when we do a post, not the post post, but we generate a post, boss. a boss, we can actually increase that feed rate uh, quite, quite a bit because our tool engagement angle is much lower on any kind of OD circular work, okay? And you see these strategies, you see these conditions right here. You know what eliminates those conditions? Adaptive clearing. Right? That's yep. what's eliminating. This is traditional. So as you go into a corner, you, your engagement angle changes. Adaptive clearing changes the step over. You've got to change two things. You either change the step over or you change the feed. One of the two. That's what you have to do if you're in traditional, right? So over here, you're, you're slowing down or you're changing the step over. Over here, when your angle gets smaller, your chip gets thinner. So what are you doing? You're speeding it up. Adaptive clearing takes that out of that, the equation, right? I like bringing this up because how many in here thread mill? ID thread mill, don't forget this when you're ID thread milling, all right? Don't forget it because when you're in an inside arc, where, where's your tool engagement angle? You're taking more of that tool. So you need to back off your program and your feeds and speeds. When you're on an outside, speed it up, speed it up because your engagement angle is less so your chip is thinner. So therefore, you're going to wear out more. Keep that in mind when you're thread milling too as well. That's bonus, okay? All right. This is one of our favorite slides, actually, because to the left, we see it all the time. We put a half-inch tool in a quarter-inch inside radius. Sounds beautiful when it hits the corner and then takes a right turn or a left turn. Usually you chip it, you squawk, you have tons of chatter. It's terrible. We do not like to match the radius of the corner with the radius of the tool. This is a little bit better in the middle where we got you know, maybe a half inch tool but we're trying to chip away a little bit you know, with it. It's still too big of a tool and the one on the end is what our adaptive would reflect and HEM totally reflects and the beautiful thing is it's a smaller tool and we're, we're actually uh, increasing your productivity by in including a smaller tool. Less but carbon. It's, it's chipping away at that corner much faster. And Biggest it's a cost better... to your end mills in the carbide. Yep. The biggest cost, that's when companies are charging you, a lot of that cost is in the carbide. So if we can reduce the size of the end mill by using these strategies, reduce the Good cost of the carbide, the price is a lot better. This is the heat uh, dissipation of, of different angles of engagement. I love this, this slide here, and I had Scott put this in. I can give you HEM in a nutshell with a nice analogy, right? Take a candle. Light a candle or light, light a, uh, a lighter. Take your finger over that lighter, right? Run across that lighter, stop for two seconds, and then come off of the lighter. Stop for two seconds, come off of the lighter. What, what happens? You can do it, right? Two seconds, I said stop for two seconds, not five. You can do it, but after a while your finger gets hot, right? Now take your finger and run through quicker. Run through quicker, you're in the heat zone, you're out of the heat zone. That's kind of HEM, that's kind of high efficiency machining. What you're looking at here is your heat zone is smaller when you're in the cut. So when you're out of the cut, 
There's all your coolant, there's your air, there's your breeze, and it cools down your tool before it gets back into the cut and generates more heat. So if you can decrease your radial step over, you decrease the heat, you can stay in that heat longer, you stay in that heat longer, your tool lasts longer. This is very important in, in anybody machine in canal in here? In canal, a little bit of in canal, tool life great, awesome. <laughs> so, in canal, it's a good. So, we have a, a range of step over that we want you guys to run. We can help you out with that as far as what, how much, what your flute count is and what your step over is. In canal, if you're having a problem with tool life, decrease your radio step over. Yep. You're going to maintain your MRR because when you decrease your radio step over, you're going to feed it faster. But, but your, your, your cutting edge is going to be in that heat zone. Reduce, especially in super alloys that are heat resistant, reduce your radial step over, you get better tool life. I think we got about five, two minutes, okay. Scott, sir. Yep. <clears throat> Let's talk about chip formation, depth formation, if you will. All these materials chip differently. Some are stringy, titanium's brutal, uh, Inconel's not easy. For sure, uh, that's what we're doing here is we're deforming the material as we're cutting. This is the area where, where our tooth sustains a lot of pressure and we need it to survive. We do edge prep, we do a lot of things in this deformation zone down here where this chip's being curled for this tool to survive. We need to shear that chip. And we do a lot of things to the tool. We do a lot of things to the geometry. I know when you look at an end mill to another end mill, they look the same. But if you look at these babies under a microscope, you know, and really look at the relief angles we're doing, the axial relief, the radial relief, there's a lot of geometry inside that end mill. Most of it's trying to really work on shearing these chips correctly. And what you're gonna start seeing now is uh, tools that are specific for specific materials. So if you're cutting titanium, you're gonna start seeing a lot of, cut, a lot of titanium cutters coming out for that specific material. And what they're doing is they're molding all these relief angles, uh, the axial, the radial, and all this, and the coatings and what have you, to that material specifically. Okay, and that's what you're gonna start seeing. This is some of our finite analysis we do with all of our tooling. And uh, pretty intricate, it gives us a lot of data. And it shows us where, uh, obviously where the heat is. We don't have it in the tool there, but it'll actually show me on the tooth of the tool where the heat um, sensitive areas are gonna be and where I probably most likely will have breakage on that tooth in 3D simulation before I even make a tool. It's pretty neat, pretty neat stuff that we're doing. This is a simple slide. What it really reflects, it looks like a lot of information. When we first go into the cut, that red graph shows you that spike of that, that load, right? That's what happens. So that tool, when it first comes in that cut, we have a huge spike from there as we're coming through that, the, the chip and starting to thin, our load's going down. Pretty simple stuff. Here, same thing. As we come in, we spike up, we start going down as we're thinning that chip. Our work, which is heat as well, is going up. This one's kind of interesting because if you look here, <clears throat> we actually have this, this load, this would be like your traditional, this is your HEM. The pink or the, the red area represents, you know, the work, the load that's being done, and the heat that's being generated. I was going to say, think about this as heat. Yep. So our HEM, our tooth is in and out of that cut so quick, our tool loves it. This is even a better representation. The work that's being done and the heat that's being generated in that thin chip is very minimal. So that chip is in and out, just like that heat slide showed you where that heat range was real short. Tool path, so we all talked about tool paths, traditional tool paths, right? Created by offsetting boundary as a traditional tool path, so offsetting boundary. Uh, overload tools and increased in the corners. Um, forces in the tools, ex uh, excess material in four cases. Initial cut, let's get to this right here, this, this is the best slide you can see. Absolutely. So this is a traditional tool path. 
We'll talk about it as we go through. So if you look at a traditional toolpath and we blow it up for you, this is your initial end mill. Let's say you drilled a hole. You didn't ramp, you drilled a hole. You come down here in a traditional toolpath. The first cut you make is what? A slot, slot, right? First cut's a full slot. Now you're doing a pocket. First cut you did was a full slot. Now you're moving out, you're passing down, you're doing a full slot. You come out to the next pass. Again, what condition? Full slot. Now we're starting to go this way, we're ideal condition. I was a machinist, I started for a long, a long time ago. I had my own shop. I ran every pocket program in my shop based on the speeds and feeds my factory guy gave me for a peripheral cut every time I was pocketing. You know what I should have been using? Full slot speeds and feeds. My end mill would have lasted a lot longer, I could have took a big, bigger cut. How do we eliminate this? HEM adaptive clearing takes all of this out of it. This situation is putting your tool in the worst condition possible. So when you're in this condition and you're taking a full slot, what do you got to do? You got to slow it down. You got to change your axial. You got to back off your MRR rate. You got to go get a sandwich because by the time, you know, your program's running, you're already on dinner or whatever and then you can come back and finish it. Productivity, adaptive clearing, uh, Fusion 360, HEM strategies. This is where you need to be to maximize your tooling, save on your tooling cost, and be as efficient as possible. You can see even as we get in the corner. What do we got, Scott? We got... We're, we're low, yep. but we do need to cover these slides. This is very, if you guys don't mind, it's yeah. very important. Yeah. Okay. I there's beer or something. <laughs> Don't let us hold up We're the beer. To it. What do you mean there's nothing? <laughs> I w we would like to go through this. This is yeah. very important for us to, yeah. yep. to understand, or, you know, to get our message across. All right. You guys good? To be anywhere? So. All right. Now we're getting down kind of to our expertise and where we're at and how do you select the tool? There's so many choices. We want to try to help narrow that down and, and help you understand what we look at and how we select the tools. So the first thing is quality. I think I already mentioned that earlier. You know, when you get into adaptive clearing and HEM, if you're using a general purpose tool, you're gonna pay a price. It's a low price on the price tag, but it's a low price because the tool's not gonna last. So look for quality, because we are gonna elevate the speed and feed drastically with adaptive clearing. And when we're working with, with, with companies like Autodesk and Fusion, we're, we're testing our tools in these tool paths. We're optimizing these tools for these tool paths. So like Scott said, with a general purpose end mill, when you're not getting somebody that's actually testing with adaptive clearing, with these strategies, they're giving you an end mill that in theory should work pretty good, not been tested. Fluke count. This is one of the most confusing things I think out there is there's so many choices. Honestly, the way we operate is we will not look at anything under five flutes with HEM, and right now we're starting to look at six, seven, and we have an eight flute half inch that we're running. So it's become pretty easy really with HEM. We just won't go below five flute. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of success with six and seven flutes. The other good thing is as programmers and consumers and you know, things you need out there, they're, coming, they're becoming easier to get. A lot of us, not just us, but other good cutting tool companies are offering seven flute and five and six with corner radius options right off the shelf. These aren't customs anymore that you have to wait for. So you have a lot of choices. Lighter radial depth to cut, more flutes. Yep. More flutes, bigger core. Bigger core, stronger tool. Stronger tool, longer axial, less deflection. Less deflection, less vibration, light radial. Plus heat. Perfect. Corner radius. Hopefully everybody in here is using a corner radius when you can. We advocate corner radius tools. Your, your corner, your tool lasts a lot longer. If you can get away with it, we really would like for you, for you to rough with corner radius tools. And again, they're becoming prevalent. Everybody's offering them as standards. You can get them. So um, 30, 20, 30, 60s are really popular. Uh, 30 thou, you know, 20, 30 thou, and 60 thou. Yep. And we have tons of those too. But it does uh, help you in the end, for sure. Somebody's Tool coding. Nice. 
Yeah, it is nice. I'm not like sure it. where that's going. The party, the beer. Yeah. Tool coating. Look, you know, tool coatings, uh, uh, they become real popular. We, we do our own coating. Sure. A lot of people are doing that nowadays. We have some of the best coatings, uh, the Altins, the Talons, and what have you. It, it get, it's getting complex, but I think the future is going to coating technology. There's no doubt about it. Those are, they are going through coatings like crazy and developing some pretty intricate coatings, layering them. That's kind of the key right now. So we're doing, a, I think, a quad, a quad layer, and they're just stacking these coatings. I mean, the whole thing's still you know, very minute in thickness. Rapidly. It's crazy. There's some new stuff coming out that we kind of got our hands in that, that's pretty cool. Really cool. So length of cut, you know, what we ask is if we're going to do HEM, we need to get a pretty long tool. Two times D is the sweet spot for HEM. Doesn't mean we couldn't do three times D. We might have to pull the feedback a little bit. Uh, and the only other thing I would say is if you're not doing HEM, because not everything is HEM, keep the length of cut as short as possible. We, ha we offer tons of lengths of cut. Five eighths on a half inch, we offer five eighths all the way to four inches. There's tons of choices, you know. So if you can use the five eighths or a one inch, please please do it in traditional. For HEM, two times D. This is one of our another really favorite slide of ours. It really kind of shows you the strength. Going this way on this chart, these tools get really really strong. So as the tools are gummier and less heat resistant, the materials. The materials. I'm sorry, the materials. You, you actually want less foods because the chips are softer. They, they, they'll evacuate a little bit better. You don't need as much pressure. As they get harder, you want to add flutes, use these strategies, and actually evacuate the chip a little bit better. What, what, what do you think happens as I go this way on this chart? What's going to happen to our radial depth of cut? Decrease. Decrease. It's going to have to get smaller, right? because I just don't have the flute room in a 12 flute. So as we go this way, our radial depth of cut goes this way. As we come here, we should be able to increase that radial depth yeah, of cut. Yeah, but what happens to our feed? Yeah, that's right, that's right. And MRR goes up. Good, you got it. good. So summary, hopefully you guys got an understanding of the principles of HEM. Everybody understands what HEM stands for, right? Helical end mills. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Harvey I told you and not Mills. to do that. Harvey and Mills. <laughs> I said we call it HHEM, <laughs> Harvey Helical and Mills. HEM, high efficiency machining. Determine if HEM strategies work for you. Does it work for you? Is it something good for your shop? If you need some help, let us know. I'm uh, Chicago, man. Any uh, uh, summer or winter months you want warm places, give me a call. I'll be more than happy to come out. <laughs> it gets cold. Bears fan. Yeah, yeah, Bears fan. Don't don't hold it against me. Better understanding of proper tool selection. We have a wealth of information on all of our websites, speed and feed, tool choices. We have a, a, a so, um, I don't know, um, I don't know how to say it, but you know, you put a half inch tool in with a certain length of cut, and it'll go through all the catalogs on its own and give you a list. You don't have to sit yep. there through a book yep. for an hour trying to look for these tools. You know, we got thirty thousand part numbers between our three companies. It's hard to go through each book. We've made everything so easy on the web for you guys, and, and you can find everything you need there, and we're available too.